So in heart failure, obesity is protective. Good morning friends, welcome to another episode of Bio News. Today I have five papers to tell you guys about, beginning with a paper by uh, Lou et al. This paper studied uh, 450 pregnant women enrolled in an NYU cohort. Uh, they uh, tested these women's urinary metabolites of organophosphate um, uh, pesticides. Uh, three times across their pregnancies and use regression analyses to compare their organophosphate metabolites to those of other women across the world and to their dietary sources and so on. What they determined was the following. First of all, interestingly, women in New York City, or at least in this NYU cohort, let's say, um, uh, had lower uh, OP metab that's organophosphate OP metabolites than populations in Europe, Asia, and other places in the US, despite New York being a metropolitan city. Um, they found that having lower pre-pregnancy body mass, being Asian, being single, and working were all positive risk factors for having these pesticide metabolites in the urine. And finally, they found that meat contributed 39.3% to the amount of organophosphate metabolites that these women had, which I was shocked to learn. I actually thought from my research historically that meat didn't contribute majorly to the amount of pesticides that people had. Um, so this is really uh, uh, enlightening for, my, for myself to know and uh, something to take account of for the rest of us. And by the way, guys, the reason why this is so concerning is that uh, if you want, you could check on my channel, just search the word organic. There's a bunch of studies that show quite clearly that consuming uh, inorganic vegetables at the very least for women uh, during pregnancy will uh, affect not only their baby's development in the first two years of their childhood, but also their propensity to develop ADHD when they're eight or nine years old and so on. So it has uh, tremendous effects. Uh, a second paper by Han et al. Uh, this paper studied uh, germ-free pregnant mice. So what they were trying to determine was this. Does the microbiome of pregnant mice, is it particularly relevant to their biology as opposed to non-pregnant mice, meaning that when you become pregnant, is your microbiome even more important? And they basically found out that yes, it is. They found out that in pregnant mice, but not non-pregnant mice, the removal of basically their bacteria, uh, having them germ-free, uh, impeded their metabolic pro uh, pathways of retinol, arachidonic acid, linoleic acid, and steroidogenesis. But this didn't happen in the non-pregnant mice. This is uh, really interesting because, you know, initially when I was uh, planning for my wife to get pregnant, I wasn't sure if, if women should take probiotics or whether it was safe or and so on. And it's quite the quite the opposite. It's extremely important because, uh, well, not that they necessarily take it, but the microbiome health of the mother is extremely important for the child. And in fact, the child receives their microbiome from the mother and it sort of all begins from there. And so whenever you start something, it always stays closer to the start. So you want to start it off well, you know, sort of like in contract law. Whoever starts the contract, the end contract remains similar to how it started. So you want to make sure the mother's microbiome is great at the beginning so the child doesn't have to work so hard to uh, recreate their epigenetics and change it later. A uh, third paper by Ma et al. Uh, this paper is a meta-analysis of studies on congenital heart uh, disease, which means babies being born with heart disease and um, the gestational, meaning mother's pregnant uh, exposure to air pollution. What they found was that carbon monoxide and sulfur dioxide were significant, statistically significantly associated with uh, cardiovascular disease in the infants. Uh, a paper by Marx et al. Uh, this paper investigated, it was reviewing historical data. It investigated this paradox that I was not aware of called the obesity paradox in heart failure, which is that uh, basically that obese people were less likely to have heart failure. Um, and so they found out that, the, or they showed that the obesity paradox is actually due to obesity being concomitant with less advanced forms of the disease. So in heart failure, obesity is protective, but it's protective because ob being obese means you eat a lot, for example, so you're healthy enough to eat a lot. So you know what I mean? So being obese is concomitant, it comes along with less advanced forms of the disease. The obesity itself isn't necessarily predict, uh, protective. Uh, 
That's what they were trying to show. I hope I made that clear. The, finally, a paper by Takahara et al. It's nice to see a Japanese name. You don't see them as often anymore. By the way, guys, in the 80s and 90s, Japanese research was uh, extremely prolific, or at least, let's say, in proportion to the total research pool, it was much larger than it is now. Anyway, this paper was a review paper on the supplemental use of ketones in the treatment of heart disease. Basically, in heart failure, the cardiac uh, metabolic effects inhibit uh, the ability of the heart muscle to utilize fatty acids and carbohydrates efficiently. So they use ketones to try to transport energy to the heart more efficiently. Uh, I didn't really know about this, so I just thought to include this for you guys in case you didn't know this either. Anyway guys, I wish you a great day and I'll see you soon.